our friends in Asia and good afternoon to our honorable speakers in London and LAG. We are back again with another set of insightful lectures from the ACNS webinars. This is the first webinar in the month of March and we have two great speakers today who are going to enlighten us about their respective specialities. The first speaker for today is Professor Ramesh Nair, who is a consultant skull base and neurovascular neurosurgeon, head of skull base and neurovascular surgery at the Charing Cross Hospital and St. Mary's Hospital, Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust, London. Professor Ramesh is the executive editor of the Asian Journal of Neurosurgery and the associate editor of the British Journal of Neurosurgery. He is an invited faculty of the ACNS as well as WFNS educational courses conducted throughout the world. We are extremely honored to have him today with us as a speaker at our webinars. Professor Namis is going to talk about endoscopic management of cellular and supracellular cysts. The second speaker for today is our honored guest from France, Professor Federico Di Rocco. Professor Federico Di Rocco is a professor of neurosurgery at the University of Lyon. He is a pediatric neurosurgery at the Hospital Femme Mere in Front Lyon. He is also the coordinator of the French Raffle Center for Canis Nostosis. Professor Di Rocco is the chairman of the European Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery Education Committee. And he is also the secretary general of the European Society of Craniofacial Surgery. He held the position of the vice chairman of WFNS Neuroendoscopy Committee and the chairman of the ESPN Education Committee. He is a noted speaker at various international venues as well as a noted author who has published more than 200 articles in various peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely grateful to him to have accepted our invitation to be a speaker at our webinars. Today, Professor Tiroko is going to talk about fetal neurosurgery. The chair for the first talk of Professor Ramesh is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Tetsuya Nagatani. Professor Nagatani is the Vice Director, Department of Neurosurgery and Director, Center of Neuroendoscopy, Nagoya Daini Red Cross Hospital, Japan. He is an invited faculty and instructor to various ACNS workshops held across Asia and rest of the world. We are extremely fortunate today to have Professor Nagatani as a chair for today's webinar. The second chair for today is also our honored guest from Japan, Professor Mihoko Kato. Professor Kato is the Director, Department of Neurosurgery, IG Children's Health and Medical Center. She is a clinical associate professor at Nagoya University Graduate School of Medicine. Professor Kato is an integral part of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society and she is on board of the Japanese Neuroendoscopic Society as well as the Japanese Society for Pediatric Neurosurgery. She is an noted author who has published several articles in various peer-reviewed journals. We are extremely fortunate to have her today to chair this session of ACNS webinars. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers and chairs to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, may I hand over this virtual podium to Professor Nagatani. Thank you very much, Professor Raja. Yes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> hello. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yes, we uh, start now the uh, ACNU uh, webinar now. So the first speaker is uh, Ramesh Nair from UK speaking. I'm Tetsuya Nagatani uh, from uh, Japan, Nagoya speaking. Yes, uh, today's topics uh, is the uh, endoscopic management for uh, Sera and Supracera cyst. Yes, this is, uh, we think is a very uh, fascinating, uh, very interesting uh, issue. So we are uh, very looking forward to the, uh, hearing the, the seminar, yes. So, uh, shall we start, uh, Professor Nair? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Thank you, uh, Prof. Nagatani and uh, Dr. Raja, for the introduction. I'll uh, start sharing. And um, if I think, if you think I'm the um, overstepping the time, do let me know. Um, I can stop at any time. But I'm hoping to take you through a review of these cases because we in UK have a long follow up for most of these patients. And um, uh, that is what I'm trying to focus on in this talk rather than the technical nuances of uh, some of these cases. I will start sharing my screen. Um, so I work um, at the Imperial um, Healthcare NHS Trust, which is also a part of the Imperial College uh, in London and um, mostly based at Charing Cross and St. Mary's. And uh, the skull based team um, we have um, a number of um, specialists, including my colleague, um, Mr. Nigel Mendoza, who is in this um, panel. Um, also, we have um, the skull-based ENT colleagues who help us with the access 
and the postoperative management and follow up most of these patients. Um, also, we have a dedicated set of uh, neuroradiologists and pathologists to um, manage our patients. So, when you talk about cellular and supracellular assist, we know that um, most of these lesions, such as craniopharyngeomas or Rathke's cleft cyst and cystic pituitary tumor, they all come under the category of the cystic lesions. And cystic pituitary tumors, we, are, we do see them quite often and they don't differ from our management for standard pituitary tumor. Whereas some of the other lesions are not so common, such as arachnoid cyst, and rarely you may get uh, a very exotic conditions like parasitic cyst or epidermoid or dermoid cyst. And these differential diagnoses should be entertained depending on the local prevalence of such conditions and the ethnicity of patients. But I will be focusing mostly on our um, long-term experience with some of these cases. So we'll start with uh, some of the cases where um, I have encountered some difficulty with uh, long-term management of uh, some cases. For example, this young man um, in 2014, he was 26 at that time. He was uh, IT, um, works in IT and went to the, the Western Eye Hospital, which is an ophthalmology hospital in London. With the visual loss. What do you see in this um, uh, scan? You can see a big cyst in the supracellular region, uh, but also if you look carefully, you can see that um, there is a mural nodule, like an enhancing nodule, right at the junction of the floor of the third ventricle behind the opticasm, where the infundibulum joins the um, floor of the third ventricle, just near the tubercine area. So that is the only finding on that uh, scan with the big cyst and um, he had a visual loss following this. Not a complete visual loss but more in favoring a bitemporal hemi um, anopia. He, he did have an emergency procedure to train it then subsequently um, came to our service. The, Concern when you drain this cyst is that's not a treatment at all. It's just a temporizing measure. Um, so the plan was to consider an extended procedure to remove the tumor and the cyst, and which is what um, we were planning to do. And as expected, within a month time, the cyst refilled and he subsequently developed further visual problem. Even though the initial the visual loss did recover to some extent. Um, he then subsequently further complained of further blurring of his vision. And the follow-up scan indeed has picked up further recurrence of the cyst. So what do you see in this? In adults, um, patients with this, uh, a mural nodule like this, one could expect a papillary type of um, craniopharyngioma. So you can see that's a stalk in the back where my uh, sucker ends and um, the, the nodule which I described on the MRI scan, you can see it clearly. The appearance is very typical of a papillary nodule of the papillary craniopharyngioma. And this, this is attached to the, the chasm is visible um, higher up and the, the base is attached to that corner between the um, so you can see that um, this is attached to that base and this is the back of the chiasm. This is where the attachment is. So as you can see, the rest of the cavity doesn't show any other tumor characteristics. There's no other tumor on the side. They're all plain arachnoid membranes. But remember that uh, this is not a pure arachnoid membrane. There is a layer of capsule of the original cyst. But there, I don't see any nodule. So this nodule was excised. And uh, you can see, and that fat graft was introduced, you can see that um, that nodule is excised. Um, but unfortunately, he did have a complication from the fat graft and he had a local infection which had to be removed um, because he uh, was unwell with the local infection and that had to be reoperated. So by that time, he had almost three operations, the initial drainage and subsequent uh, removal of the tumor and the fat graft. And that's a um, follow-up scan after the removal of the fat graft. And in a few months' time, um, this was the original surgery was in June, and this was in October. So a few months' time, there was a small recurrence. And this time, if you carefully look at the the scan on the right-hand side, um, the scan from March, which is another few months, 
can see there was another uh, tiny nodule here. So the original nodule is no longer there, but there is another neural nodule which is in a different location. And that nodule wasn't there when I operated me initially. So these lesions, even though the fist wall may look very innocuous and benign, it is possible that they can recur in different places. Um, and that cyst uh, then started to expand. Um, and you um, can see that nodule very clearly. Then I had to do another extended endonasal approach to remove that cyst wall. But part of the cyst wall always was attached to the inferior surface of the chiasm, which could not be removed. So, so now that he had almost four operations endoscopically, and then he was sent for radio, radiotherapy. The plan was to give him 25 fractions, but after about 23 fractions, he come, started complaining of visual loss. So obviously there is a recurrence of the cyst and it was a concern whether one should consider one should consider removing it over to the delay further intervention given that he's just going through a radiation so um it since the ritual deterioration remained stable at that point we decided to wait for a few weeks by the which time he completed his radiation um then he again had a, a, a follow-up scan and it shows this expanded lesion. So this is a recurrence of the craniopharyngioma. And the question was whether to consider a redo operation through the endoscopic approach or whether to consider a transcranial approach. Given the recent radiation and multiple operations in the past, one of the considerations was to consider a transcranial route. One of my um, approach for such a cystic lesion is um, a supraorbital approach, which is a standard approach where you make a small craniotomy around the, um, uh, just above the orbital rim. And these are the markings, um, which are a mark for the landmarks, the supraorbital nerve is marked, and the incision is just above the eyebrow or to the eyebrow in this case. Uh, and then you consider the exposure. And also if you look at the, the position of the head, the head is tilted back, so that gives you the retraction the gravity-assisted retraction helping you with the exposure. And the, the intracranial approach could see the previous infection and the previous surgeries has caused some additions of the brain tissue, possibly part of the gyrus rectus to the tuberculum here, so which is being removed. And uh, once you open up, um, and also you take out the front wall of the cyst, so again, this is um, the standard approach to decompose cyst. Again, once you done the uh, masculization from the top, you can have a look at the walls to see whether there was any any um, reason for this to recur. Um, and uh, often it's related to the additions of the arachnoid and um, occlusion of the, uh, the fenestrations you made in the past in this case. So this is a right optic nerve. So I'll just go through some of the anatomy while we see these videos so for the interest of the trainees here. So it says um, the right optic nerve here, and this is cell of flow here, just to, to, to orient yourself. That is, we will um, go back in to have a look at it. So again, right optic nerve, so to the right side of the approach, the carotid artery here. This is the retro carotid window here. Again, one can look through that retro carotid window to see that third nerve. You can see the oculomotor trigon and the cistern that travels along with the oculomotor nerve the posterior declinoid, and once you follow the third nerve, then um, you will reach the um, posterior fossa interpedangular cistern, where you can see this is the carotid artery again, so we'll just fast forward it again. So this is the posterior communicating artery joining it with the PCA here, there's a P2 segment. The third nerve, this location, remember, is an always constant location to identify the posterior cerebral uh, circulation. The patellar bifurcation is here, and um, the, the P1 and the P com here, and the third nerve on the opposite side. Um, and the, the, that's the superior cerebral artery. So again, as you can see, the third nerve is in a constant location between the PCA and the uh, superior uh, cerebral artery. Um, so, it's important to, to realize all the anatomical features, especially if you're planning to, to open up the arachnoid in such cases. In this case, it was really not necessary. I just wanted to show you the 
anatomy for the sake of um, interest. So this was the um, the final. This was a transcranial operation, and the post-op scan showed a good clearance and uh, no further recurrence at that time. Um, but was that the end of his um, treatment? In last year, just before the pandemic hit us, he came back with another cyst. And he himself initiated a follow-up scan because he knew that his vision was deteriorating. Um, after the initial deterioration, it remained stable and the pandemic came and he was very concerned about coming into hospital, so we waited. But uh, as soon as the situation got better, we got him in uh, to consider a redo operation. So you can understand he's had five operations so far and um, had radiation in the past. So these are not e difficult, easy cases. And there's always a risk of uh, non-healing wound and risk of CSF leak. In this case, the recurrence is closely related to the optic chasm. This is what I found during the operation because it's a capsule with the tiny papillary nodules were seen on under surface of the chasm. So that's not something which I could reduce. Here I just wanted to, to be make you aware that in spite of this fifth operation, the pedicle is very viable. This is the pedicle of the nasal septal flap, which is traveling down into the floor of the sphenoid sinus, and um, it's easy to, to, to separate it. But the only problem with the redo flaps is always that um, they tend to become more chunky and more um, uh, shorter and smaller. So when you're planning such operation, if you're use, just using that flap, your, your approach will have to be, uh, be uh, taken to, to take that into consideration. If you're planning to a wider extensive operation in such cases, you may have to utilize other flaps in this in this case, my intention was to drain it, given uh, all the operations. Um, and um, again, again, part of the cyst wall was uh, removed. Um, and again, in, in fact, of ha having had problems in the past with the fat graft, I decided to use some fat graft. So this is the most recent scan from two weeks ago. He remains well. Whether this is the end of his um, journey um, as far as we are concerned i'm not certain we'll keep a close eye on all these patients for years to come the there's a question about further radiation treatment or gamma knife treatment or other agents it's something which uh, we will consider most of these cases you know in the adult um these are papillary uh, type of craniopharyngiomas and and most of these papillary craniopharyngiomas are um, positive for BRAF uh, mutation and and um the papillary craniopharyngioma has got the um, uh, papillary projections and also smooth external capsule and often can be separated from the adjacent brain, but not always. Even in papillary and adamantinomatous type, you can see small nuddings and projections into the normal brain, which makes it difficult. But the adamantinomatous type is more difficult and they have more chance of calcification and, and more invasion to the brain. Here you see this uh, wet keratin and um, the the squamous uh, epithelium and uh, the patient uh, I just mentioned about was positive for BRAF mutation and now we are applying for further treatment using a BRAF inhibitors. Similar case uh, but slightly different um, scenario here it's a, it's a man who um, came uh, with a large cystic lesion predominantly in the suprathalar space but occupying the third ventricle. He came to the unit with an acute worsening, um, cognitive decline, memory impairment and this features of rise intracranial pressure. Went through an urgent neurosurgical procedure by the on-call team where he had this um, cyst fenestrated and decompressed and the biopsy was taken from the, from the cyst wall through a transcortical approach through the frontal lobe and it came back as a craniopharyngioma and it was referred to our care. So given that he got, he had significant cognitive decline, we wanted to give him some time to recover from this before considering a proper a transnasal endoscopic approach. Um, a while waiting, he came back with the further, then it's, with the further scans, it, it reduced further, but then he came back by end of uh, that year with uh, another large cystic recurrence. You can see that the solid portion is in the suprathalar part, but most of the cystic part within the third ventricle. Um, so by 
few months time it it remained stable but he was getting more and more symptomatic and he then was prepared for an endonasal approach in this case one could have to understand it's not like a solid craniopharyngioma there are subsection subsets of um, craniopharyngioma which are really and suitable for endovascular total excision and um, that's one of this is one of the best advantage of endoscopic resection of craniopharyngioma not but not all craniopharyngiomas in this case you can see that um, the this is an exposure um, endoscopic exposure of the tumor it's been resected part of the solid component but see as you go into the third ventricle the the walls are lined by the tumor um, tumor um, tissue and uh, it's often difficult to to remove it and that can cause invariable damage to the walls of the third ventricle so ideally uh, if it is a, a, a adherent tumor to the walls of the third ventricle including hypothalamus it's best not to try and peel them off we right giving a reasonable um, uh, attempt to remove it but found that um, um, they are very uh, firmly adherent this is a problem with some of this craniopharyngioma when they share some blood supply with the um, blood supply to the floor of the third ventricle as you know the craniopharyngioma often derive blood supply from the vessels around mostly of the anterior circulation especially the a1 or the um, and on the side of the craniopharyngioma can get supply from the pcoms but um, they never get supplied by the posterior posterior circulation because of the embryonic origin of it and um, this is a the post operative uh, scan which shows this lining within the third ventricle um, and then he had radiation with that uh, tumor and fortunately he remains well this is the most recent scan and um, he hasn't had any recurrence but it is un- difficult to predict that this is going to recur with in, in course of time and this is something which we need to watch out for and even those cystic tumors uh, may indicate that the surgical excision may be a bit more easier that's not always the case for example this is one of our uh, long follow up patients initially had a, undergone an endo not endoscopic transfusional uh, drainage of a cyst uh, when he was 29 now, now he's 30 now he's 60 years almost 30 years ago and he came back in 2005 with a cyst this is another this is a scan from 96 and then if we carried on watching him and the cyst started to change fluctuate in his size um, without making much difference to his um, visual um, condition this is a 2008 scan and then 2000 i can't really see the so this this remains stable for some time but then in 2011 it started to get smaller spontaneously and by 2012 it got further smaller so this tend to wax in veins which is a nature of some of the cystic lesions which we need to be aware of so just because something is changing unless there is a clear clinical indication there's no reason to to immediately go in and uh, do a big operation because these are major operation with a potential uh, major risk so this started then um this expanding further by 2015 he had another uh, surgery this is an extended procedure Uh, after planning the extended operation where the tumor i could see that it it was quite close to the antisubal circulation uh, and uh, in spite of the cystic nature of the tumor i found that it was firmly adherent so in the recovery phase i noted that um, he was not really sort of he was slow to wake up even in the recovery phase in the next 2 3 weeks he was not, um, so this is related to the fact that there was a perforated damage to the cordate head of cordate nucleus if you if you see patients who had perforated damage to cord and nucleus you can always see that they are a bit slow to respond but they will make a good recovery and um, this is the immediate post of scan you could see the the changes in the corded head but the the tumor is not there the like optic chasm is well decompressed and subsequent scan follow up scan showed mature infarct and without any recurrence he did have subsequent radiotherapy um, and then so far has remained without any recurrence this is the most recent scan in 2020 so we again we keep an eye on this patient for a long time so with that in mind uh, i have a question so sort of debate this was submitted last week um with this lady was 42 meter to our unit with a, a large cystic tumor just like the second case i showed you 
um, with um, cognitive decline and signs of intracranial pressure, what is the best management at this point? Should one consider that a patient's got raised ICP and, and reduced GCS, so one should consider an emergency decompression of the cyst transcranially uh, and may, maybe perhaps do an aseptostomy uh, and a VP shunt or should one do put an Omaya reservoir in it or whether should go ahead and do an endoscopic resection of the tumor. So it all depends on the clinical scenario and these are the debates we need to think about uh, in such presentations. If the patient is clinically well without any uh, major clinical concern and if we have time, my preference would be to avoid any hardware in these cases. And I would consider an extended endonasal approach with an attempt to remove the tumor. Because often you may be lucky that uh, the, the cyst wall may not be adherent to the sides of the third ventricular wall. But the problem with uh, uh, shunting and, and preoperative uh, drainage from cortex is that um, the, the procedure through the nose is often a contaminated operation. They don't get meningitis most often, but when you have a VP shunt or Omaya reservoir, there is a risk that you could potentially lead on to a subsequent meningitis. But a valid option is to do that sort of drainage procedures and shunt operations or a Omaya reservoir insertion when there is a clinical concern rather than waiting for an elective a major operation. So what about Rathke's clust cyst? These are Rathke cysts or past intermediate cysts. They are often seen, but they become symptomatic in many patients. They are tall. They consist of the wall consist of a tall ciliated columnar epithelium, and they can behave in some patients like multi recurrent kidney pharyngiomas. So this is a young man. He's now 45. I saw him when he was in his late 30s. Investment banker in London. He was having progressive headache for many weeks, but he decided not to go to hospital and get medical help. But he got, he panicked when he started getting visual blurring and could not um, read the numbers on his computer. So he was admitted locally and the scan showed a cystic lesion. This is a cyst on the preoperative scan, again, given um, his acute visual deterioration, had an emergency decompression that night and subsequently was planning, this is not a treatment again, just like the craniopharyngeal decompression, this will recur, but, and probably it recurred, and um, we planned an extended endonasal approach to remove the tumor. And uh, this will need proper transplanum and transcellular approach, including using the, uh, removing the tuberculum. The, even the Saratsky cyst, often they may contain inserted material or some solid portions along with the cyst wall. So a flap is being harvested, uh, a dural flap, sometimes harvested, one can stitch back. In this case, I was able to stitch it back, but generally I don't do um, a dural stitching following such operations. So the tumor appeared very um, solid and cystic in this case, but attached to the undersurface of the chiasm. You can see the capsule atta getting attached to the floor of the chiasm there. And most of the tumor um, was um, removed in piecemeal. Um, and um, so this has been removed in piecemeal carefully. We'll skip the technical parts of the operation, but there was a part of the tumor that was attached to the stalk and um, you can see there's the remnant. So this is the last part. Uh, the stalk is here, along with the capsule and a, and a solid bit of the tumor. And this is a young man who did not have any other pituitary dysfunction or diabetes insipidus. And the question is whether one should sacrifice the, the stalk in the first operation or whether would you do it in a recurrence. So my policy is often to, to avoid a permanent diabetes insipidus um, and do it only when it becomes necessary in subsequent courses. So this is being resected. You can see how adherent that is to the floor and the back of the chiasm here. Uh, and that part had to be left behind. So obviously they have a small remnant and it came back as Ratkis um, to a surprise. Uh, it was not a craniopharyngeum, which was the initial diagnosis. And it started to grow within a few months time and started to get bigger. 
So we had to consider an extended transphenodal resection because of its um, expansion and further pressure on the septic apparatus. In this case, um, I did make a preoperative consent for elective um, stock um, section, which is what um, um, was uh, ideal for him. This is the, I just want to also highlight that whenever you do redo operations, the flap remains quite viable and um, you don't lose, you don't have any landmarks and you may have to depend more on the navigation system in such cases, especially for the superficial part of it. But once you go in there, you have the landmark. This is a nasopharynx and you can see the, the pedicle of the flap uh, going down and lining the cavity. So again, once um, the, the tumor is removed, um, this is the part of the cyst and the tumor attached to the uh, infantibular stalk. The optic chasm is higher up here. Uh, mammillary bodies, you can see there. Uh, I'm just going to speed up this. Um, and so that's the stalk uh, along with the tumor is being removed carefully. So this, one has to accept the fact that he's going to get permanent DI and this is going to be a lifelong medication for these patients. So before one makes such a decision, got to be absolutely clear about the management options. So here the, you can see his, his stock is all removed and um, he didn't have a follow-up scan. So the most recent scan from two weeks ago, he remains um, without any recurrence. I, he never had any radiotherapy because it's a con recurrent rat case. The controversy there is about whether radiation is needed or not. So we didn't give radiation to him because that will eventually lead on to hypopituitarism. Another one, uh, again, a long-term patient, uh, initial um, presentation in 2001 with a large cyst, which was drained and uh, started to recur. Over the years, it remained stable but by end of 2019, uh, 2009, it started to get bigger. Again, um, had to have an, another microsurgical drainage of the cyst, um, and then it started to get smaller uh, with the years. But in 20, later on, it, it had a hemorrhage, and uh, by 2012, it got bigger. So this is when I had to. Uh, we, we did another endoscopic approach to drain it um, and then uh, it, it recurred by 20, uh, I can't really see the 20, uh, yeah, 2016, it came back. So again, a, a redo operation where uh, you um, expose the base, As you see it's not like a, a clear fluid. By years of cystic accumulation is like an inspirated mucous material, almost like a, an abscess. But this, are, this is not an abscess, this is the same thing you see with some of the cystic pituitary adenoma, same material you see with uh, Rathke's cyst for long-term collections. So this is all it, it is, I'll just wash out. And um, that's all that's required for that case. And uh, she remains well with all this uh, follow-up. And um, another patient who's fairly is old now, 78 years, but um, came initially with this last cyst, which was treated. Again, had a recurrence in 2013, um, and um, we had to, uh, to do an extended endonasal endoscopic approach to drain the cyst and resect the cyst wall. So uh, these tumors, these cystic tumors, are not easy to remove. Even I, I mentioned before, even though they are cystic, they are often adherent to the floor and the chasm. So, and here the stock is uh, fortunately separate. So only part that had to remove was from the floor of the third. I just escaped the, the thick wall and I, I it dissected off and carefully um, removed. So, she did not have any further recurrence. So this year remains risky. So the other common cystic lesions um, we encounter are arachnoid cysts. They're not that unusual. And the one important thing which I would like to emphasize is a, a clear, definite radiologic diagnosis. Because many of the radiologists might uh, consider this as a cystic pituitary tumor or other cystic lesion where one may 
consider a straightforward endoscopic endonasal approach. Uh, because uh, it, there is a debate whether what's the best route for these tumors. These are uh, simple cyst walls with fibrous connective tissue lined by meningothelial cells. And to demonstrate that, is a, she was 10 years when she was diagnosed with the diagnosis. She was, in a, she was being followed up in our um, uh, uh, the children's hospital in London, Great Ormond Street. And um, this scan from 1991. So when she came to us, when she became an adult, she had a, this big cyst, but she also started complaining of her visual problem. So she did have a bitemporal uh, field deficit, not complete deficit. Even though the cyst did not change over a period of time, she clearly was concerned about a visual problem. So the question was, what is the best route for these uh, lesions? Are you um, D come to the lesion or uh, open up this lesion or fenestrate this lesion endoscopically or should you do it transcranially or should you do it endoscopic transcranial approach through opening it into a, a ventricle. Here it's not going into the third ventricle so it's not that option, it's not here but that's one of the options. In this case I started with an endoscopic approach where I drained the cyst and fenestrated the walls of the cyst endoscopically. But then, this is a problem with the arachnoid cyst with such an approach. She had CSF rhinoria, which I initially repaired endoscopically, had further leak, which then prompted me to concern the transcranial route, and then open up the cyst walls and, and repair the floor from the top. But that leak didn't stop, which then we had to consider a further, a more um, uh, aggressive repair from the endoscopic approach, and then she remained well since then. So. The point I want to emphasize here is that some of the arachnoid cysts may not do well with an endoscopic approach in the beginning. Um, so she didn't, this is the scan from 2012, several years later, um, and so the scans and she remains well without further recurrence of the cyst. It always depends on how much fenestration she do. So the next case is, this, say, another young chap, he was 20-year-old librarian came with a, a visual blurring and it's making his a job very difficult as a librarian. So the scan showed the large cyst, again a supracellular, nothing into the fossa uh, and mostly involving the supracellular cistern. Again, the, since I have uh, over the years shifted the management of arachnoid cyst to a transcranial approach uh, for arachnoid cyst mostly, and it's just such a, an elegant approach through a two-probable route where you could open up multiple cisterns, open up multiple walls, the optic nerve, the clinal process, or just speed up, and um, and open up. The important thing is that uh, even the opening into the posterior wall of the cyst into the basal cistern is important. Um, and also you could open up into the um, uh, system, uh, liquid membrane to make sure that um, there's a free communication. It's a window between the carotid and the optic nerve. Just gonna open up here. So that's the pituitary stalk which is being exposed. That's going into the floor of the uh, cellar here. Um, so he remained well and um, all these scans showed there's no further recurrence. Sometimes you feel that um, the, the, there is still some cavity, but that's not a major concern unless there is a pending um, or, or fluid entering and not leaving, like an old-way valve mechanism, they don't have any further recurrence. So do not, there's no need to get disappointed if there is a, a remnant a cavity. Here you can see the flow into the basal cistern like through the, uh, in the CSF turbulence you can see in that picture. Similar case, 2016, a lady in her 60s uh, with a, a radicnode cyst. Again, the, you can see the transverse, uh, the coronal section showing a, a thinned out chiasm and a uh, uh, cyst under pressure. A transcranial route is what I did in this case. Again, the right optic nerve uh, and the left optic nerve and the carotid on the left side, a big uh, fossa. The cyst was entering into the cavity and um, if this is just a, an endoscopic view to, to confirm the walls of the cyst to make sure that that's the olfactory nerve. And um, she improved. You can see the chiasm uh, is much thicker, but as you can see there was still some space here. It may not be under pressure, but then she had further recurrence. Um, 
the question was whether to consider any other approach or to redo the transcranial approach, which is what I did. So, in this case, a redo transcranial um, supraorbital approach going through the same approach, uh, one has to expect uh, additions, um, the optic nerve on the right side and carotid, and you can see the thinned out um, dose and very um, flattened, and it's very, that's the pituitary flattened out and the floor of the cella here, uh, this is an endoscopic view, you can see how um, the uh, the dosum is thinned out. The third nerve, which is on the on the left side from the um, interpedangular cistern. Okay. Um, the one thing with the redo operation is to make sure that uh, the often the reason is that these fenestrations you made get sealed up. The lateral fenestrations or the anterior and posterior fenestrations get sealed up. So you need to make sure that they are all opened up um, to avoid further recurrence. So we will, um, I think at this time we will stop. Um, and this is the uh, a recent case waiting. Standard pituitary tumors, which I will not go into, uh, they are all cystic lesions and uh, surgical management is not very different from the uh, standard pituitary tumors. But there are some lesions um, with, like a dermoid cyst, not very common. This is a ruptured cyst, uh, uh, which is from the literature showing that there is a dissemination of the condens within the cranial cavity. And um, epidermal is not very uh, common, but possibility and often a preoperative diagnosis, it can be well made with um, the specific sequence which you do for epidermal cyst to diagnose it. So they are not very common. What about these um, uh, lesions like hyalurated cyst or cystocosis? It all depends on, it you have to include it in your different diagnosis depending on the um, local prevalence or the ethnicity of, of um, ethnicity of patients. So I would like to conclude um, that even though they are all cyst lesions, not necessarily that you have to definitely operate them uh, at all costs if you see it expanding. If there is a clinical concern, of course, you may have to consider intervention, but if not, then there is always a possibility that some of these lesions can spontaneously change. The second thing is that um, even though they're cystic, that doesn't make them any less complex. They're still complex and they can get major complications like I showed one, in one case where there is a perforate injury to the head of cordial nucleus. And there are, can be other compl complications, including damage to the stalk or the chiasm. And uh, uh, to rule out uh, unusual lesions, especially arachnoid cyst, I, as I mentioned, I, I moved away from endoscopic route for, to transcranial route for arachnoid cyst. So it's important to clarify the diagnosis before you operate on cystic pituitary tumors and other lesions. So I would like to thank you and uh, the Imperial uh, Trust is a combination of hospitals uh, in St. Mary's and Charing Cross and uh, Hammersmith. And this is my team, my colleague is already here um, and this is my ENT team and we have a skull based fellowship program and the fellows also are part and parcel of our service here. Thank you very much, um, Professor Nagatani. Uh, I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Professor Nair. Yeah, very good and very nice presentations. Uh, you present a very difficult and very tough cases. In all cases, very tough, and especially in the craniopharyngeal. Yeah, so uh, in my opinion and our uh, concept uh, is that the, the first surgery is the most important, I think. The, so the even the uh, the most part is cyst, but uh, we should do the uh, best effort to remove the uh, cyst wall, uh, even though the, uh, we cannot uh, preserve the uh, pituitary stock. Yeah. Yes, we uh, have many times uh, recurrence. You, you, see, you show the, the, uh, the similar cases. So. We uh, also experienced uh, many times uh, recurrence, yeah, very uh, difficult cases, uh, yes. So I want to your uh, opinions for the uh, surgical uh, philosophy, or, <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. Um, I think that's a very valid point. As with, as with most of our neurosurgical problems, first chance is the best chance. Um, but many of these patients, uh, which I showed you, especially some of the cases, um, they had their um, emergency procedure done to temporize the situation, but the, the, the final definite diagnosis, uh, the, the surgical procedure, one has to try every, um, if, make any, every effort to try and remove um, whatever that can be removed safely. With the craniopharyngeal or tumors affecting the stock, my inclination is to avoid a permanent uh, damage if it is intact um, as the first time. If there is a recurrence from that remnant, from the stock, then I will go ahead with an elective resection or section of the stock um, with a proper informed consent because it, it is not an, a problem in, in, in most of the countries because you have long term follow up and you have a, a, you can keep a close eye on this patient. But in some countries, it may be difficult to to let these patients to go home because they, they can have significant problems in following your instructions in terms of managing their diabetes insipidus. And not every place may not have a, a proper neuro, a neuroendocrine or endocrine service to follow these patients with a strict monitoring of their um, uh, input output or their doses for their um, um, uh, desmopressin. So I think it is reasonable, especially young patient. And if you think uh, that uh, a further occurrence is possible, and if you can get a good curative resection with the stock resection, I would go for it. But whether that you do it in the first instance or second instance, I probably personally do it in the second instance. Oh, sorry, I agree with your, your opinion, yes. So the second question is the, about the arachnoid cyst. The arachnoid cyst, I, my, uh, I have very good, uh, very big interest for Sarah arachnoid cyst. So the, in my uh, first series, we uh, we do the transnasal approach, you ordinary approach, and of, and often the only the some uh, stoma or very small small stoma or uh, remove the uh, arachno membrane uh, only partially. But the, in some cases uh, we have uh, the problem for recurrence, recurrence, yeah. And then the, we switch the uh, our opinion so. And now we do using the extended approach for argonal cyst in the most case. And then the, we do a cyst systemy, okay, and make a, a cyst fenestration and make a holes be between the system. And then the most case okay, is not a record, yeah, okay. And, uh, also, we uh, now the, we prefer to use the Prasera uh, orbital approach, keyhole approach is the second choice for the management of the uh, arachnoid cyst. So, how your opinion on the for arachnoid yeah. cyst? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Well, I think that's very interesting for me to hear that um, um, your philosophy about arachnoid cyst. I think it's very sensible to give it a try through a standard endoscopic approach and, and, and do a minimalistic uh, drainage uh, in the first instance. And, and some of these patients may settle down with that approach. And also, I'm um, um, very uh, interested to hear that um, in some cases, you consider ex extended endoscopic approach for, for uh, arachnoid cyst. Um, it, it is a reasonable choice. Uh, where you can, that's the problem with the endoscopic approach if you do it in a standard fashion where you don't have much exposure of the walls of the arachnoid cyst to fenestrate into the posterior cisterns or the basal cisterns. So when you do an expanded approach, this is the this is the advantage you have. But then it is an expanded approach and slightly um, the morbidity related to the that approach is slightly higher. So I, I haven't got a very dogmatic and Mixing about whether to stick with the transcranial approach or endoscopic approach. Um, given that um, once you have a leak through the nose, it's often you have to take this patient back to theater and repair it, and there's an additional morbidity to a nasal cavity and maybe put a lumbar drain in. So often it it that can all be avoided through a, a, a very straightforward soup orbital route that is my feeling but I, I take your point I think it's a very valid point that one cannot be very con 
sort of strict about these approaches and it's often uh, you have to take case by case. Anything else, um, Sureshtar, you want to add on to that? Yeah, uh, th thank you very much. It was a great uh, lecture, uh, Ramesh. You are hearing me, Ramesh? I can hear you, yes, we can hear you. Ramesh, you addressed very well about the problem uh, with uh, recurrent papillary craniopharyngioma, recurrent earthquake cleftsis, problems with arachnoidosis, and also you made a passing mention of uh, pituitaries. My question to you, Ramesh, how long will you keep on chasing a, a recurrent papillary craniopharyngioma? And uh, you made a passing mention of, uh, again, uh, BRAF inhibitors. Uh, have you stayed, have you in England? Because there are reports, uh, publications of uh, uh, BRAF inhibitors along with MAPK inhibitors for recurrent papillary uh, craniopharyngiomas. First, you give BRAF inhibitor for two weeks, then you give MAPK inhibitor for another two weeks, then follow it with surgery because tumor size will come down, then give uh, uh, radiation. This is the, what is the opinion for you from your side in England? Are you doing this? And second question also about recurrent rat case clefsis. They say they respond reasonably well to uh, stereotactic radio surgery. So you have comments for these two. So thank you. Um, it's very uh, valid uh, questions, especially regarding the papillary craniopharyngiomas. Um, they, they tend to recur if you leave any small flake on the um, chiasm or the infundibulum, they tend to recur and um, they can be difficult. How long would I chase these lesions? Um, I mean, as you see from the, the case I showed you, um, he had almost six operations so far, but whether I would go back in again, um, but I, this is the reason why at the end of the, when you feel that you may not have anything more to offer surgically, um, apart from causing further neurological deficit, you would want to consider other options, including maybe instilling radioactivity, which is not very common in these days. I haven't used it for a long time. And about the BRAF fit, most of these papillary canifragimas are, almost all of them are BRAF positive. And um, this is the first time the oncologist in this case decided to apply funding for his uh, treatment. Both BRAF inhibitors and the MEK inhibitors I'm not sure which one he is going to get. I think it is uh, Vemurafinib, I think it's what it's applied for. Not sure what their regimen is, but um, this is uh, an expensive uh, treatment. That's why a separate funding is required for these sort of uh, cases. But the, the experience from our unit for craniopharyngiomas for BRAF inhibitors, that not that many actually. This is uh, only case in the last 10 years, which I'm seeing the oncologist um, preparing for such a treatment given is a long uh, multiple recurrences and um, about the what else uh, the question was what Radke cyst yeah. so radiotherapy or even stereotactic radio surgery for Radke cyst um, it is a controversial subject among the oncologists when I had the one of the cases which I showed you um, it behaved like a craniopharyngioma had multiple recurrences but with the, the resection of the stalk and the final remnant, he, uh, there was no further recurrence so far. But that is not to say that um, there is no risk of recurrence in the long term because they all get followed up and you just have to be aware that there is always a possibility. But stereotype, the radio surgery was not considered at that time given that he was very young and the radiotherapy is likely to give um, a pan uh, with time. So the question then comes whether SRS can be useful. If you have a very focal uh, remnant which you think cannot be removed, uh, attached to your, the, in, the, the stalk or the, uh, the chasm, which it is, is a reasonable surgical uh, stereotactic radio surgery, target, I think is a valid option. But the case which uh, we didn't give because I was very convinced that uh, got every bit of the tumor out. Thank you very much all the faculties and Professor Ramesh Nair and Professor Nakatani for that excellent lecture. Yes, thank you very much, professors. So we are enjoyed very much uh, this time. So uh, to see you next time, uh, Professor Raja, okay? Yeah, sure. Yes. <laughs>
Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll wind this up now officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President of Sioko Kato. I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers for today, Professor Ramesh Nair and Professor Patrick Odiroko, and the chairs, Professor Mihoku Kato and Professor Nagatani, for coming here today and teaching us about their respective subspecialities. Thank you, Liu Bun Seng, for my co-host for today. Thank you, all the distinguished faculties who joined. So until we meet on next Saturday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you.